Good morning, everybody. It's been Erev Shabbos, almost two Shavuos. And it was an interesting thing yesterday. I much the last minute, you know, first thing in the morning, I get a, a, a message on Thumbtack. Someone wants to get married that day, yesterday, that evening in, in Manhattan. And I got the job. So I, as I mentioned yesterday, went down to Central Park, did the wedding. And the, uh, the bride was Muslim. The groom said he was raised Christian, but was um, but was not practicing. That's the way they, and she was from Morocco. He was American with a, a Jamaican background. So it was, it was quite interesting, particularly that yesterday and today and tomorrow are on the Islamic calendar, Eid al-Fitr, which is the one of the two major holidays in Islam. There are other minor holidays, <coughs> like Ashura, but the two Ids are um, the Eid al-Fitr and the al So, um, the... The Eid. Anyway, Eid al Fatir is to celebrate the end of Ramadan. Eid al Adha is to remember the Akeda, actually. Uh, what we call the Akeda. Uh, Akeda Yitzchak, of course. Uh, Muslim, the Quran doesn't say who, which son it was, but the, there's a tradition that they think it was a different son. In their, in their traditions, obviously, we know the Torah tells us the truth. Uh, in any event, the interesting thing was, was that, you know, I, I'm, here I'm observing a, a member of the Islamic community on, on their holiday. And I spoke very nicely about which then made Muruku Burak and I actually did a little bit of research that Muhammad married his wife Aisha during the month of Shawal, which is the month that just started the, the in the Islamic calendar where they celebrate the Id al Fatir at the beginning of the month. And how that means it's an auspicious, even though they were married already religiously, this was just a civil marriage. But how is something auspicious about it? And they appreciated that very much. And the reason why am I talking about this? I'm not here to toot my own horn, not here to try to be some kind of a white savior or anything else. I'm just saying, you know, when this is a nice thing, and I mentioned, even though. I don't know if, if he had if they had the Nika ceremony. It's a, uh, I would assume most likely he made the Shahada. I don't know, but he, he, I don't know how religious he is. The the group maybe in Morocco they're more liberal because the Quran doesn't say uh, that the it, you know it's only a hadith that the that uh, an Islamic woman has to marry an Islamic man, but the. But in the Quran, it doesn't doesn't indicate that there's no issue. Certainly, no issue in the Quran about uh, an Islamic man marrying a non-Islamic woman, who's the people of the book uh, to have an interfaith marriage there. But also the other way around as well. Um, it, the common Islamic practice, according to the Hadith and the Sunnah is that a, a Muslim man can marry a non-Muslim woman and the woman does not have to convert but if it's a Muslim woman marrying a non-Islamic man, he has to convert. That's generally the way that's understood in, in Islam as opposed to by us in, in Judaism uh, you, you have to convert for it to be a, an authentic religious marriage in our, in our faith. Um, if, if one partner is Jewish, the other is not. The other one would have to convert, and it's not—it's not a simple thing either. You know, they, they have to really mean it. They really—the the, the conversion has to be um, for their whole life. You know, it's not—it's not that they're converting. 
you know, in order to to get married, uh, even though technically the conversion would be valid and the marriage would be valid, but we, we don't do that. We're not supposed to do that. But if the if the person who gets interested in Judaism because of this relationship understands, or maybe before the relationship, and, and, and there's various reasons, there's a lot of things going on in the world, uh, how people come together. But in any event, uh, the main thing I would say is that this person has to understand vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis marriage, uh, you know, conversion and marriage and so forth, is that this person, the one converting, has to understand that if their partner is out of the picture, they're still Jewish forever. It's not something they're, you know, I remember Steven Spielberg and his wife, I don't remember her name offhand, and he grew up in an Orthodox home, more or less, but um, maybe not the most pious, but the going to an Orthodox shul and so forth. But they asked his wife, did she convert for him? And she said, no, I, con I converted for us, which is a nice, a nice idea. I, I, I appreciate what she said there. It's actually something very deep. But uh, really, she has to convert for her, you know. I mean, I, people have, com have accused my wife of converting for me, which she was, <laughs> she was converted well before we were married, anything. Um, you know, when people just assume that, especially less religious people, and she said, oh, she didn't convert. <laughs> she said, that's, that's not a reason to convert. She converted because she wanted to be able to keep Shabbos. She, you know, she she wants to be able to keep mitzvahs. She, you know, this, she she the way she described it was that you know, oh yeah, you could just be a, a keep the seven seven mitzvahs by Noach. She said that's like that's like waving at God from across the street. I want to be on the same side of the street as God. You know, and that's that's the way we we approach it. So anyway. Anyway, and she gets very offended when people accuse her of that because, and not for, for the least, or not that it's not even true. Anyway, uh, so I, I the reason why I'm mentioning this is that you know we can people know I'm a pretty politically conservative fellow, religiously conservative as well, but. I believe that diversity is a conservative value. Uh, you know, I believe that it's important for us to be educated about other faiths. Um, I sometimes hear some more, some people who are fundamentalist, whether fundamentalist Christians or fundamentalist atheists, who are upset that the that let's that let's say Muslims during Ramadan are afforded certain things uh, accommodations that would seem to be out of place to some people. Particularly, I was thinking, like, in public schools, you'll have Muslims who, uh, especially you have a sizable Muslim population, and they, and accommodations are made for, for Ramadan, including uh, time for prayer, uh, and so forth. And then the question often is, well, why don't the Christians get that? And, and the answer is very simple. If the Christians really asked for it the same way the Muslims do, they would get it. Because if the Muslims are able to get it, then the Christians are able to get it, right? It's the atheists 
the militant atheists who don't want to have either one get any of these things and they want to take religion totally out of the world uh, I don't mean a libertarian atheist or, or a secularist who doesn't care what other people do and, and, and believes like Christianity teaches to live and let live more or less but they uh, you know the extremist leftist who wants to control everything uh, will say you know that they should not you know none of these should be able, able to do any of these things right like you see in some of the other countries where you're not allowed to wear religious insignia in a public uh, Public, whether it's a public, uh, a government building or something like that, which is, a, that's the case in parts of Canada, it's a case I believe in, in France, and, and was for a long time in Turkey as well, and educated, I think, America is a land of diversity. It, it has been from the very beginning. Um, you know, I I, I, I I would recommend people to read uh, which is available for free online, like on the Kindle, if you have a free Kindle app on the phone. Many years ago, I read Ben Franklin's uh, autobiography. And you read there what authentic classical liberal liberalism was in the founding of this country. <clears throat> you also find his own personal prejudices there. And it's fascinating because here he was a man who was liberal but also believed in virtue, recognized his own faults, recognized his own failings, and even expressed his own prejudices and bigotry, um, while also embracing diversity. And part of it has to do perhaps with his own experiences in life, and so you had, and, and, and you find a similar thing with another great, very liberal founding fathers would be Jefferson. The dichotomy and the, and the complexity of life that both of these men embrace while becoming archetypes and, 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 and you know, these are our founding fathers. These are these are men that we have tremendous respect for and, and who deserve tremendous respect with, with all of their warts, meaning the fact that they're not perfect is certain, maybe even greater because it demonstrates how greatness can exist without perfection and how, like Voltaire, I believe, is the one who said that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. You have both um, both Franklin and Jefferson <coughs> had a profound respect for Islam, but meanwhile, uh, at Jefferson, I know for sure, and I, I, I would assume Franklin as well had a strong respect for Judaism. And I know American Muslims have a tremendous amount of respect, particularly for Jefferson, where they see Jefferson as somewhat of an honorary Muslim because of his own theology and ideology in life, private and personal, uh, how he viewed Jesus in a more or less of an Islamic manner as opposed to a traditional Christian manner. Things like this... Uh, are fascinating and important to know about and that that's part of our American heritage 
uh, along with, but that does not in any way diminish the importance of Christianity in American history and in America today. And, and so I think the way, I, I don't think Christians being more or less the majority, um, depending on how one defines one as a Christian, certainly if we take the most liberal approach to what it means to be a Christian, the Christians are the majority in, in, in America and the largest religion in the world. And I don't think they should find themselves as being threatened by minority groups as much as seeing whatever accommodations that might be made for minority group exist, make sure that those same type of accommodations, when available, would be available to them as Christians. And, you know, this has been something that I've fought for for a long time, that, that Christians should be treated the same like everybody else. I remember I was once sitting at a, I was, uh, since I was the rabbi of a synagogue in Richmond, Virginia, I was a member of the executive board of the Jewish Federation there just by virtue of being a, a synagogue rabbi. Uh, as opposed to everybody else there, they were the ones shelling out the big bucks, and I was the one who, well, I lived next door to the building, so I was like, why don't I just go to the meeting? I don't have anything better to do. Right? I mean, I do have better things to do, but I, I felt that it was important. If I'm invited to, to attend something like that, I should go, which most of the other rabbis never did. Or only did on, on rare occasions. But I was, I was there, whatever it was, monthly, every month. So anyway... Um, Remember, there was some resolution about prayer and the necessity for neutral language and prayer and chaplaincy or something like that. It was coming up in the state house, the state legislature in Virginia, and the majority of the folks there. Um, all Jewish, but not none of them were Orthodox, uh, as far as I, I remember, at, at least at that meeting. None of them, uh, and they, I would assume, would identify themselves as liberal, but I think this vote shows that they weren't liberal in the classical sense, but, uh, not necessarily leftist, but left-leaning, and left and liberal are two different things. I gotta stop this. I gotta get to learning and stuff. But um, they gave me, they allowed me the time, which I appreciate, to voice my opinion. Is that uh, why, why should? Meaning, the whole point was that um, you know, if a chaplain gets up to pray in a uh, military setting or whatever other setting that might be um, in a state function like that, that basically if they're Christian they should not be praying in the name of Jesus. And I was offended by that because, you know, would we say the same thing, that Muslims should not mention Allah, that that I as a Jew shouldn't offer prayer in Hebrew perhaps or or something else that's uh, Judaism you know in general uh, there are very few things that, that uh, actually are in Judaism that would really offend any other religious person you know there, there's a joke about the ecumenical conclave 
where all the different religions got together to decide what are they going to give up um, you know so 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 as not to offend the other one right and, and, and they and I'm not going to get into what all the different things that every religion decided to give up and then and then uh, you know the Jews you know had their representative you know get up and say you know we're going to give up the, the second you come pork on uh, uh, you know like meaning uh, a minor part of our liturgy that you know it's not even uh, universally the Sephardic Jews don't have this in their liturgy at all actually but I think that was like one of the things that uh, the reform movement you know started with when they when they uh, sought to cease to, to change their liturgy it, part of it was that uh, was this particular part of the liturgy because uh, so whatever various reasons that they might do that they might you know because uh, the references are, are outdated or something because of it's a reference to Babylonia or something uh, like that That we're praying for for the exiles in Babylon, whether they're in the Holy Land, that we're praying for the Jewish community both in the Holy Land and in Babylonia, because Babylonia would be the archetype of the exile, and was the exile at that time when it was composed. So, uh, but in any event, that that that's the point of the joke, because you know, there's, there's really not much that the, the Jews have that, that anybody would be necessarily offended by, although, you know, some people artificially create, you know, offense, you know, by by making it that, you know, it's the, the Talmud, it's, it's this, you know, the types of lies that, that, uh, that, that certain uh, Judeophobic groups say against the Talmud, and they associate the Talmud with anything bad, and they'll say, and they'll, they'll take some passage out of context, you know, to, to try to say that the Talmud uh, supports something that it quite obviously opposes because they, they're taking that that passage out of context. Anyway, um, and, and, in, and in any event, you know, we... We don't live by the Talmud. We live by the Code of Jewish Law. We learn, we study the Talmud as a mitzvah, but and as a devotion, but not uh, as a means of deriving exactly, you know, what we do and how we live. But rather, uh, that was done for us. You know, the, the code, the, the codes, the, the law codes. Uh, you know, sifted out the Talmud and said, you know, this is what we keep and this is what we don't keep and so forth. And, and it's much more complicated than that as well. I'm really oversimplifying it. Uh, but anyway, the back to the story about whether or not Christian chaplains could pray in the name of Jesus. Um, I said, you know, I, I mean, I think a big part of it, though, uh, why the liberal quote-unquote Jews um, are uncomfortable with that thing is be, with that type of thing is because they are uncomfortable with their own religion I, a lot of it has to do with that they're they're insecure with themselves and that's why they're insecure about others so any event we they, you know their that was their point was well this is the majority and they're going to overcome the minority if we let them do that so that's why we kind of we have to stop them and I was very offended by that and again this is just a, a, a small conclave uh, not really um, that's significant in the in the big picture, meaning, all right, so this is the Jewish Federation of the Greater Richmond area. Um, you know, 
so so they were deciding, you know, what public stance are they going to take about a particular issue, and so what, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really mean that much in the grand scheme of things, you know, we, we when you're within a particular parochial group, it's very easy to forget that there's a world outside, meaning, uh, you know, when you're on your Jewish Twitter and you're in your Jewish Twitter bubble and you see everything's about what's going on right now in the, in the Holy Land and we're all focused on that, we're all obsessed with that one way or the other and most of the rest of the world doesn't care, meaning CNN, and I don't know this because I watch CNN, but they mentioned on the radio, uh, you know, but the one person on the radio who, he's not Jewish, but he, he cares a lot about Israel, um, and he's not the typical, like, evangelical that you would think would care about Israel, uh, but he, as Hugh Hewitt, he's a Catholic, actually, and, but he's obsessed with Israel, and he's, he was saying to Liz Cheney, on, uh, he's like, you know, CNN, you know, there's a war going on in Israel with, with tremendous global consequences, or at least potential global consequences, and instead of, uh, even, and they didn't even mention that, instead they're focusing on some minor uh, battle within the Republican Party. As, uh, you know, like, you know, Liz Cheney and, and uh, Lee Stefanik. And, you know, what, what does... But the fact of the matter is, you know, uh, most of the world doesn't care about Israel or Jews or anything else. Uh, we care about ourselves. We care <laughs> and about things that are adjacent to us in that manner. I think I remember learning that lesson when I was, and not only about, you know, with the more popular Israeli politics issues, but even within our own bubble of, of our Haredi Hasidish Jews, I was sitting on a subway in Manhattan, I believe I was passing through Manhattan or Brooklyn, I was, I was coming from Brooklyn. And I think that it was coming from... I spent Shabbos in Borough Park. I was going back to Queens. And I was on the subway. And... Oh, I gotta answer this call. Let me finish this thought and I'll call the guy back. Um, so I was on the subway. And... I remember this. I even, I think, wrote a little poem about it. I, I don't know if it got lost. I posted it somewhere on the internet. Was when I was in college, and I, you know, dressed in the Hasidish Levush, it was Matzah Shabbos, it was Saturday night, I'm dressed in my Shabbos clothes, and sit riding on the subway, going back to Queens, and I might have still been in Brooklyn, or going, or near Manhattan, or whatever, so the left to me was a woman reading a book, Chernobyl, across from me to the left, and across from me to the right was a group of young you know, I guess early 20s, probably around my age, uh, or a little older. I was probably yeah, 19, 20 at the time, and maybe maybe 21 already. And they were talking about, and, uh, they didn't appear to be Jewish or anything. No, they were all uh, young, white, looked kind of affluent type of, maybe hipster type of people a little bit. And they were talking about how they were going to go to a party in Williamsburg. And how that's a cool place to go. And it's the hip place right now to go to Williamsburg. Uh, now, for those who don't know, Chernobyl, everybody knows about Chernobyl, was, uh, was the nuclear meltdown, right? What they don't know is that uh, that was a, a famous Hasidic city. If you heard of the Tversky dynasty, the, which, you know, there, there's several Chernobyl Rebbe's, and there's several Square Rebbe's, and, and Rach, several Rachmas Drifka Rebbe's, and a few, and uh, several Hornish Teipler Rebbe's, and a few others, uh, you know, too many to name right now, from this dynasty coming from Chernobyl, the Tversky family, it's, uh, 
they're great saints among our, our people. And of course, uh, Williamsburg in Brooklyn, uh, Williamsburg, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I would see the commercials for Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, and then, you know, my, uh, my great uncle, he was in the, in the nursing home in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and my, my great great uncle. So my great uncle said something about going to Williamsburg. And when I was a little kid, I'd seen the commercials, like, what, in Colonial Williamsburg, like in Virginia? I didn't know. So anyway, uh, I once went to Colonial Williamsburg, it was Cholomoyd, so I had my strive a lot. <laughs> the other Williamsburg was Cholomoyd Pesach. So anyway, the. And everyone was, was so fascinated by that, you know. Anyway, <laughs> people thought it was part of the, the show there. But anyway, you know, I realized, you know, to the left of me was a Chernobyl with no Tversky's, and to the right of me was a Williamsburg with no tidal bombs. All right, thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe, comment, and we'll see you later.